If you've ever wanted to learn how to handstand but got stuck or frustrated, then this episode is for you. Go. Hey, first of all, thanks for being here, man. I'm really keen to get into this. Yeah, it's my pleasure, man. I'm looking forward to having a good little chat about handstands and whatever else comes up. Yeah, dude. So when I was doing research for this podcast, the first photo I could find of you on Instagram was you doing like a one-arm handstand flag on canes already. So my first question to you is, did you just come out of the womb being able to do a one-arm handstand? Or <laughs> If not, then what is your... What's complete your complete opposite? Like? Yeah. Complete <laughs> opposite. Like, I guess it's such an individual thing, and you notice that people's backgrounds are so varied. And if people have done dance and different things growing up, they usually pick hand balancing up a lot quicker because a huge component of it is body awareness. Mm. So orienting yourself in space or assuming the correct alignment required for whatever position you're working on, and that's that's a huge thing because of course it's strength and conditioning and stuff like that. But you can be very well, just not be able to balance, right? So body awareness, which I guess ties into alignment and positioning, is a, is a huge part of it. So for me, I was starting with probably more sort of experience under my belt movement-wise because I had an active childhood. I did quite a lot of martial arts and surfing and skating, and I always had some kind of physical practice, especially growing up in the countryside where is nothing else to really do but right. climb trees, go surfing, you know, climb on the neighbor's roofs and jump up and down and then run away, like stuff like that. So we had to kind of create our own fun just from running around the place. Um, so for me, no, it was, it, it, even so, um, I think it's quite universal. Everyone thinks they're their own special brand of challenged when it comes to handstands, but I think it's quite universal. It's just kind of pretty fucking hard. Um, and I certainly didn't fall out of the womb doing one arm handstand. It took me <laughs> a long time, longer than a lot of other peers who were doing the same thing, but also faster than others. It is really quite an individual experience. Yeah. yeah, I think you're so right. It is so individualized. And of course, we all have, by virtue of different backgrounds and different morphologies and different strengths and weaknesses, we all have different challenges when coming to the handstand. But it's fucking just super super hard so it's pretty pretty brutal i think I, I i refer to handstands as personal development as well because <laughs> <laughs> if you think you're like special see i when i first started doing it i'd sort of pick some other things up pretty fast and you know you grow up and people are like when you're younger everyone's like oh you know you're talented you're special you're intelligent you kind of get fed that more when you're younger and as you get older like you're just like oh I suck. <laughs> so for me, it was a bit of like an awakening of, oh, shit, like I'm going to really have to work hard at this and I'm not particularly talented and I'm just going to have to deal with that. So there was definitely some internal resistance initially because it was just so difficult. And then, you know, as I went along, there was definitely some personal growth and a lot of things that are positive came out of it besides just getting more skilled, I guess. Yeah, so. dude. I love that hand sends as personal development thing. And I definitely, I want to get into that later on in the podcast and, and ask you about what hand sends kind of brought to the rest of your life as well. But I also want this to be a really sure. actionable podcast as well for people listening to really hopefully avoid some of the pitfalls that both you and I have made, but especially with, you know, incredible length of experience and breadth of experience yeah. as well. So yeah, there's a lot of stuff we can get into. But, you know, if you're yeah. first, if you're like already doing one arm handstands in 2016, like when did you start hand balancing and how did you start? I reckon my first exposure to kind of being inverted upside down on my hands and doing like some form of a handstand was when I was probably 13 year old, 13, 12 years old, uh, doing capoeira. Oh, nice. Environment. And, you know, as a kid, I didn't really get much training. I just flung myself up. I couldn't hold a handstand. I could walk around with my legs going everywhere. And I never really trained it specifically. I wouldn't say like my handstand journey, like proper training started then. It's just when I was exposed to it. But throughout the years after that, when I was doing other physical things, I could still always kind of kick up into a really dodgy handstand and walk around just because it had kind of been that seed had been planted when I was young. And then when I got to the age of about 20, 21, I was working in gyms in London as a personal trainer over there and a gym instructor. And I was doing quite a lot of weights. And then for whatever reason, a little bit of calisthenics started sneaking back in. I started working on pull-ups and push-ups and things like that. And that kind of just naturally led me to start doing a few more handstands a bit with a bit more consistently. I had a goal to be able to just hold still. And I just taught myself how to do that from just flinging up and trying, mm. which, is, which is sometimes the case. Um, I think because I had that previous movement background as a kid, that 
allowed me to get to a certain level just by myself, where a lot of people that try that method when they're starting as an adult can spend, you know, three or four years just kicking up and falling over and not really getting anywhere. Um, and it was a pretty key moment where I went and saw a circus show. A friend from the gym that I had made was managing a circus nightclub where you'd go and have a really nice meal, really cool music, you know, really good service. And you'd sit there having your meal and having a drink and there'd be a big, long kind of like catwalk table where circus performers would come up and do aerial straps or hand balancing and That's manipulation. Sick. And, and so, yeah, it was really cool. And there was one act, which was really cool. It was a guy on straps. I forget his name now, but he did a James Bond straps act. And I just thought it was so cool. And at the end, my friend introduced me to him and we had a chat. Turns out he was also a hand balancer. And I just said, look, I'm doing handstands, yada, yada. Like, when did you start? Blah, blah, blah. And he's like, oh, yeah, I started when I was like 23, trained at NICA, so the National Institute of Circus Arts in, in Melbourne. And it kind of just made me realise like, oh, like I could actually pursue this and get somewhere. I had this idea that I had to be born into the circus from the age of three. And I guess that ties into another thing that helps unlock a mental barrier I had in place that a lot of people have, which is that you can do some pretty amazing things pretty late in life. And I think through things like social media, there's like positive and negatives to social media. Obviously, there's a lot of positives, though. A lot of people are seeing like, you know, 50 year old guys and girls like learning one arm handstands. And there's something that clicks in your mind when you see that you go, oh, like I can do that, too. And that's that's a pretty huge thing. So there was one guy, his name was Steve Atlas. I've never yeah. met him in person. We've missed some messaging back and forth, but um, he's a great guy. Seems to be running a really cool gig over, I think, in the States. Mm -hmm. And I saw him. He was maybe in his 40s or late 30s at the time and I saw him doing some pretty amazing handstand related stuff and I went fuck you know I'm like 21 22 if he can do it at that age what's stopping me so that was a pivotal moment and from that point I got in contact with uh, Uval and began some pretty serious focus training uh, for the first time so I would say probably about eight years ago is when I went all right I want to do this and I wanted to do it for myself. I tried different jobs. I tried an office job. I couldn't sit still for more than, you know, an hour in the chair, hated it. I tried hospitality. It wasn't for me. And I kind of just made this personal promise to myself that like, I'm just going to do this and I'm going to do it for me and everything else can just fuck off <laughs> for the time being. So I really made it a priority. If I missed a session, I'd train Monday to Friday. If I missed a session, I'd make up for it on the weekend. I was quite gun ho for that first year, year and a bit yeah dude that's a sick story there's so many highlights in there first of all that james bond strap show that is awesome and i love like first of all taking inspiration from around you and i think yeah there's so many negative parts that get talked about social media that for a good reason as well but i think the close mm -hmm. cousin of that comparison that can be quite unhealthy is permission as well and to get the permission to get the understanding that there are other people out there who've walked the path before you who are like, Hey man, like they started then, like maybe I could do something like this as well. And just like you said at the start, there's all these temptations and I've definitely had them as well to say, Oh, well for me, because I'm tall or I've got skinny wrists or whatever, these excuses. Yeah, are, excuse. yeah somehow what stand in the way from me being able to do this skill. And yeah. while that might present a unique brand of challenge, you know, at the same sure. time, like I've got, a, I've got, a, I've got a big butt relation to how tall <laughs> I am. Doing plunge fucking sucks. Style depressors are really hard for me. Like, but I'm not going to be like that's going to stop me. I'm just going to have to get stronger. So <laughs> <laughs> you get extra advantages on the dance floor as well. So it makes <laughs> balances it out. Exactly. So eight years, kind of specific hand dancing training up what point did you start taking students and teaching and when did you begin that up that branch of your career yeah good good question um yeah it's kind of been probably the last four years and a bit that I've really just focused almost all in on just teaching people how to handstand and it just started with renting um space in a local baptist church hall down the road and just running like a casual class and just just starting that way you know charging what five or ten dollars for a an hour, hour and a half class. And that was, that was pretty much it. And I guess for me, I was in a unique position where I had a job at a gym working for a really beautiful um, couple. And um, so the unique situation where I had work with them, 
a livable amount of income and hours. And they were paying me, obviously, for my services. I was teaching classes, doing some PT and stuff for them, doing some reception work. And I started that casual class and it just generated, I guess, momentum and it felt right. So I went, I, I went for it. And as I got more and more, you know, private sessions and classes running, I just reduced the amount of gym work I was doing for them and increased the amount of teaching. But I was using their space eventually. So I started paying them and they were happy and I started dropping shifts. And then eventually I just had one shift left on a Friday. And I said, guys, look, I want to give this up. I want to teach handstands on this day. And they were like, yep, that's totally fine. So there was, was a transition over about a year, just kind of went like that. And the handstands increased and the, the other work decreased. And uh, I just haven't really looked back since then. That is super cool. And I think it's a really nice transition as well. Often people can romanticize the dropping everything and quitting my job and leaving everything and putting it all out in the line, but it doesn't have to be this huge leap of faith. You can Mm -hmm. make slow transitions. That's again. You you, you can be strategic about it. And I think maybe that happens with people when they just drop it all at once. They've been doing something that doesn't align who they are for too long and they get to a breaking point and they wait Mm -hmm. for the breaking point. But I think if you can look forward and be a little bit more strategic and go, look, I don't want to do this in another year. What can I start doing now to get me out of this situation? Um, and we all, we all do it in different ways. Like for me, I'm in love still with teaching in person here in Melbourne, but at some point I'd love to travel, mm. but I want to still teach handstands. So, you know, it's been about a year now. I've just been doing little bits and pieces and building that up in the background um, rather than just quitting all in person teaching <laughs> one day and pissing off and then figuring out while I'm on the road, you know, there'll be something set up there already. I think that's a super smart approach, man. Yeah. I'm really keen to get into the weeds about handstand stuff. Mm. There are, it's Lots such- of weeds. <laughs> there are so many weeds. Yeah. <laughs> it's such a rewarding practice, but it's also one of the things that it's not like learning many other physical skills. I think mm-hmm. there's a spectrum of complexity of learning physical skills and some things you can really just dive into and pick up pretty quickly. And other things, yeah. a lot more weeds and a lot more traps, like we're saying. So let's just say I've got a bit of a strength training background, done some gym work. When I first come to you, and want to learn how to handstand. Let's say I've never really been upside down. Mm-hmm. What is our first couple of weeks going to look like? Yeah. So I think handstands, why it's so difficult. One of the reasons is it's this really evil combination of physical conditioning and skill. And you can only practice a skill with as much work capacity as you have. So that's, that's one thing to definitely definitely think about the other thing is to answer your question like people coming in for the first time is just kind of to assess them you know some people will have hypermobile shoulders and hypermobile wrists some people will be very tight in those areas Um, so it's going to be more or less of a focus on those different areas depending on what presents and then it's just generally how I how I approach it with someone in that situation if they're really starting from ground zero is a structure before balance kind of mindset. So I'm not going to worry about them kicking up and trying to catch a handstand or spotting them for balance and stuff right off the bat if they're starting from a really low like physical conditioning standpoint. So a big focus to me is just on structure and not just holding handstands against the wall like their external rotators might be really weak. Their pulling strength might be really weak. A bit more of a general across the board approach. I mean, people who have done a fair bit of just general strength conditioning PT with a gym or with a sorry personal trainer before coming to me make great students because a lot of that stuff is already taken care of and the focus can be more on just the handstand stuff itself while still pushing along those other elements in, in the background. You don't want to have a super unbalanced push and pull, for example, as, as you go along. I've tried that. It doesn't work <laughs> um, on myself. So, yeah, I I would really say just I would assess them, see what they need. People are quite different. Some people I've had, I've worked with, and their physical preparedness is amazing. They go on the wall, they hold three minutes. They've got good body tension, really strong, like core. You know, everything looks great. Then you go to balance them, and they're just like a falling tree. Boom. Let go of them. Boom. Or they're doing their, say, wrist drives, or sorry, I'm calling by the normal name, toe pulls or heel pulls off the wall. They come off, and they just there's no reaction. There's no feel. It's almost they have a thought that they just have to hold really still and by luck they might stay there. So that's one extreme example. Then then a lot of the focus will be just on teaching them balance mechanics, teaching them how to feel and correct. And um, yeah, then you have the opposite. You have some people have incredible feel and they can wiggle around and fight for that position really well, just almost naturally, but they're really weak 
And then that's going to be the thing you're going to focus and build up. So it's quite a broad response, but it is, it is like we said earlier, like a really individual kind of scenario, coaching handstands to people. One, I'm so glad you brought up the assessment piece because I could not agree more. And yes, handstand is very specific, but I also think this applies across the board, like understanding that human bodies are super, super complex and they're all going to have different starting points coming to the same skill. So what yeah. one person needs is going to be very, very different to what another person needs. You mentioned like shoulder external rotation and all of these different qualities are definitely going to affect how like the kind of structure that's coming to the balance. So yeah, I think that this is part of a reason why working with coaches is so, so, so crucial because unfortunately it's not always as easy as just jumping in to be like, oh, this is a, all beginner drills, all beginners should be doing this. Now there are some good bank for buck ones, but yeah. if you're really interested in making some progress pretty early on, then I'd say an assessment and trying to figure out what you need and where you need to work in order to kind of get into that shape of the handstand. It's just totally. it's much, much more efficient process. Um, it's also one of the reasons I only teach one-on-one or in a maximum small group of six people in person. Mm-hmm. So I run these six week short courses here in Melbourne and I only have six people because they all need different things. And six is, is sort of the number that I like to have where I can individualize effectively still and set everyone up with different homework and different programs to work on it, different skills and drills are during class. So yeah, dude, I definitely feel you. And, and I think I'm, I'm pretty similar as well. And I want to kind of start a little bit more zoomed out with those general principles and then zoom in more and more and more to more specific stuff. So sure. if you were to give me the rundown of what you think the first principles of a handstand are, like the big buckets of types of things that people need to work on, concepts that they need to understand when beginning a handstand practice. Yeah. So obviously, like we talked about structure. So just, you know, one thing I often joke about when I teach my classes is if you were going to go and do a tango or a salsa class, right, and you could only stand on your feet for 10 seconds, you're not going to learn the dance steps very well, right? Right point, yeah. (laughs) So it's kind of like you just need that base conditioning, like really classic benchmark is a lot of focus should just be on that physical preparedness and getting like a one-minute chest-to-wall handstand, let's say just to give you some capacity and time on your hands to work with. So that's like a really big, just initial goal, you know, and learning the alignment and form and things like that as well. Then once you have that structure, it's more about balance mechanics. So a sort of, I guess, a mental understanding of overbalance and underbalance. So overbalance will be falling over onto your back, underbalance will be falling to your stomach, and then working on drills to address those things. So someone gets the feel for what takes place then. And what's quite funny is sometimes you get someone and you explain everything and you just see them that it's like they're hearing it, but it's just nothing's computing. And it's even a case of spotting someone sometimes and just going, I just want you to push you with your fingers. Don't even try and be good or balanced. Just push that. Or, okay, we're going to go into handstand and from the hip, just move your legs like that. Just so they can feel that, oh, shit, where my legs are in space influences which way I go. And then, you know, like toe pulls, heel pulls. I mean, there's, there's a million drills But again, it comes back to like looking what the individual needs and giving them the right stuff. Dude, this is really awesome as well. And especially because there are thousands and dozens of drills out there. And Oh, there's drills out your ears. It's crazy. It's like, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And so many, I think the kind of marketplace of the internet is really driven toward in fitness drills and drills and drills and drills and exercises and exercises. And and this is the one exercise, the top 84 exercises that you have to be doing if you want this and it can really di- distract from the underlying principles as and understanding well, what specific outcomes are these drills eliciting in the body what are we trying to do with each one of these drills and how do we plug and play this into the person that needs it the most and this is the most important thing one of my favorite um i guess like learning experts named josh waitskin he's a chess grandmaster amongst and martial arts and other things and he Ooh, wow. talks about positions of on a chessboard beginning with positions of reduced complexity and so what that means is there'll be a like just a pawn and a king for example and or just a pawn and a bishop and a king and just understanding how these pieces move and how they affect relationships on the board oh, the goal yeah. is not necessarily to jump in and, and win the chess game first battle no. but it's to understand the, the kind of big underlying principles and how to apply them and how they affect different things 
because the overall skill is so complex that if you try and do everything out of the gate, you're almost certainly not going to have the individual constituent parts to pull that off the first time. Yeah, so you try and do everything, you do nothing, essentially. It is, it's nothing. 100%. Um, and going back a little bit to just assessing people, I guess one of the things that you develop with a lot of experience is just an eye to seeing what's going wrong. So just like after you watch a lot of bodies try this kind of stuff, you start noticing small details. Like a recent example would be a student that I had where they could rebalance off the wall well, they had good conditioning, good strength. But I just, I kept going, why aren't you catching your handstand? It's like, it's, it's always a puzzle. It's what keeps this interesting. It's like you, you get challenged as a coach, right? Um, and I was watching, I just noticed, watching the hands really carefully, um, she just wasn't breaking with her fingers when she was kicking up. Because this is key moment when you do an entry to handstand where there's quite a big drive. I call it wrist driving. So driving with the wrists and hands into the ground to stop yourself falling over. I call it putting on the brakes, just with the hands. And she just didn't understand that that was required. We sort of talked about it, but until sometimes you really like just drive the point home, it doesn't happen. And then sometimes, and this is rare in handstands, you have these aha moments with a student and then immediately it gets better. So that's an example of something like that, where she's like, oh, okay, I really need to slam on the brakes harder than I'm used to doing in my, uh, let's say, heel pulls to come on and off the wall and I'll be able to stop myself. So it is definitely being very present when you're working in person and just watching. There's quite a lot of just me sitting back and getting someone to do 20 reps of something just to get also an average of what's happening. I want to see 10 of your just average ones at least to get an average of the thing that's happening the most often. Super important for coaches, but also for the people learning the skills, because this is a chaotic skill. This is, oh yeah. there's so much going on. And, and so to think that, well, uh, there's a question that I get asked sometimes as well. I mean, I'm not a hand balancing coach, but I do help some people with their handstands a little <laughs> bit. And especially early on, people say, oh, so what am I doing wrong? And well, there can be on one rep can be one thing, and then on another rep, and it can be something completely different. Exactly. And they go, "What? What do I do to stop that happening?" I go, "Well, yeah. the thing I tell you to do to stop that happening might be the complete opposite of what you need to do in the next kick up you do." Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, which is be. a frustrating answer, but I think this is why yeah, volume of, of practice and, and repetition is is so important. And also, another thing that you mentioned early on is body awareness as well, and. Mm, awareness, absolutely. proprioception, understanding where your limbs are in space. This was one of the hardest things when I first started handstanding because I'd never done any inversions as a kid. Never, mm. I had a trampoline as a kid and never even once attempted <laughs> so a backflip. I. <laughs> I never even once attempted a flip because I was like, that is dangerous and that is scary and I'm terrified of that. Oh, my, my older brother just forced me to. <laughs> oh, yeah. I needed that older brother because he's, I was He's just, like, you're not getting off this trampoline until you do a backflip and he'd just spin me over and then eventually... <laughs> But yeah, like you mentioned your background in, in capoeira and, you know, there, there's a lot of cartwheeling and different inversions and different Absolutely. balancing positions. And like you said, it's a lot more dynamic in some ways. Some people will do walking around quite a fair bit, but the, the emphasis is not nearly as much on staying still, but understanding what your brain, if your brain freaks the fuck out every single time you go upside down, well, that's, a, that's sometimes a quality that we need to be able to cultivate first just like you said if you can only stand on your feet for 10 seconds well if your brain literally cannot abide you being inverted because it's like a perceived as a dangerous position and it's not something oh, you've done before yeah that's another thing that we need to focus on as well so i'd love for you to talk a little bit about that kind of body awareness piece and how you cultivate that with clients yeah so one of the biggest things i encounter because as much as you know we post of our sometimes our advanced students learning one arm handstands and like doing cool sequence with their legs and all that kind of stuff like the majority i mean it's changing a little bit as i do this longer but a lot of the work i do is just with like beginner beginners people that might be terrified from falling over i get less people that are terrified from being upside down i kind of have a bit of a prerequisite to work with me that you should have at least like a 20 or 30 second wall handstand. I don't care, back to wall, chest to wall. Just because it shows that you've taken some initiative and just tried, you know, right. you've yeah, just cool. done something. Yeah. Um, but what's really common is just people being afraid of, of, of falling over. And that's a, that I wouldn't lie, that's like a challenging thing to overcome sometimes. It can be as simple as 
with strength comes confidence. So once you build their strength up, they feel safer with doing the movement. But even then, a lot of the time, people are just terrified. Um, that's something that in person, it's almost vital with some clients or students to actually just spot them through the movement. So mm. I generally just build up the strength level to a, re a reasonable level, you know, say 30 to 60 second chest to wall handstand to start with. And then I just break down the movement of falling. And I've got my own specific way of teaching falling that seems to work pretty well. It's something I also observed most people just did naturally when they hadn't had a fear of falling. Um, so I'll heavily spot that at the start. And I've had people, you know, fuck, shit, ah, scream out, like all, all kinds of things. We always laugh when they're back on their feet. But, you know, some genuinely terrified people, like screaming almost. <laughs> But it's like, I've got you, I've got you, it's fine. So I, I spot quite heavily. And then as I just see their confidence level increasing, I just spot less and less and less. It's just like slowly removing the training wheels off, off what they're doing. And I guess the only real danger someone has when they're learning to fall or freestanding handstand, when they're not super proficient yet, is if they panic. Because And even if you just fall flat, on your back it's only happened like twice in my classes over the last you know five years or so and the person has been totally fine the only real danger is you totally panic and you just let your arms go and fall on your head like that's the only way i can think you like seriously hurt yourself you know or you kick someone next to you but, you know you spread everyone out in class um so i guess what i'm sensing or looking for when i'm working with someone at this level we're talking about is that they're not going to panic because you can tell you see someone they get quiet you know they might start sweating more you kind of just sense that they're stressed out and then I probably won't let someone fall by themselves then you know so it's just feeling where they're at like their psychology and just reading the signs a little bit and then knowing when to back off more back off more back off more and I get to a point with some people I'm like piss off go and fall in the middle of the room you're just bullshitting me out because I know <laughs> that it's safe and I know yeah. that it's fine it's just a block in their head at that point and I'm confident they'll be okay um, you know, I've even told some students, I go, you need to go and see a hypnotist. Everything fine will spot. It's like <laughs> they almost need to be put under with the watch and just, it's okay, you can fall, you know, you'll be fine. So, yeah. Yeah, dude, I, I love this. And I think we're really starting to, uh, you know, at least for listeners, starting to put together a map of some kind of key concepts that they need to understand. You mentioned the structure and just the basic structural integrity, endurance, being able to, you know, stand on the feet in the, in the south of dance. Oh, I think it's a great analogy. Yeah, if you're a beginner, and you have, and you're listening to this and you have like, you're just starting as an adult who's done hardly any kind of training at all. In most cases, you'd be much better off and getting a really good, just general strength and conditioning coach, you know, body weight would probably, would probably be better and just getting strong and just working basic mobility and then starting the handstand journey. It's going to be a safer, smoother and more fruitful process for sure. 100%. Yeah. I, I think that there are those structural prerequisites to be able to not to begin training because obviously the training begins when you oh. start working on the structure stuff but yeah the 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 training that looks more like kicking up to a handstand begins mm -hmm. after a certain structural prerequisite for sure. And, yeah for sure yeah. yeah and i think so that's a really really key piece to understand another big bucket that we've been talking about is the balance piece and you've talked about different risk drive, different underbalance, overbalance, understanding how to do those micro corrections. Totally. Another, again, huge thing. You mentioned that rigidity. When I first started handsing, I just didn't understand that it was a dynamic process. I would just kick up and just try and lock myself in as much as I could. And then just, I was like, oh man, I really can't just, I'm just not, not strong enough to hold this. I yeah. didn't understand that you didn't just like hold your breath and get as tight as you could. And then just hope that you stayed there. I didn't understand that yeah. it was a corrective yeah, yeah. constant and corrective I think, exercise i think why that happens as well is that yeah this is one of the, i guess this minor downside of social media is you go on social media and you watch like some crazy acrobat or someone who's very proficient handstands and they're just they look still especially yeah. on camera yeah they look like they're not moving and you go oh shit i just need to get there and not move and i'll be like them but before you're still like i, I call it the wiggle i love when someone's learning and i see them going all over the place because they're actively fighting there for their position. And as you get more efficient, you get more efficient and you start reacting to overbalance and underbalance or the falling much earlier. So it's the illusion of being still. But yeah. a demonstration I do in class a lot on day one, so I'm doing a six-week course, is I do a handstand and I go, look at my hands. And I hold the stillest handstand I, I possibly can. I just go, watch my hands. And you'll just see all these 
little tiny twitches. I try to do my best to keep it still, but there's always those little movements going on. And I go, okay, what should happen when I stop? The moment, like half a second after I stop rebalancing with my hands, I just fall over straight away. Yeah. So it's this illusion of stillness, but it's it's dynamic. Like you said, it's it's very dynamic. It's just very small and subtle at various levels. Yeah, 100%. And another kind of piece that I've taken from another guy, bro, is a movement coach, Bren Vizirglu. Or Vizirglu, I hope I'm butchering his name. I've had him on another episode of this uh, this season of the podcast, actually. Yeah. And he has a drill where he teaches people that there are many, many different points of balance. The balance is just the center of like your center of mass over the base of support. And so you can balance in a really forward leaning, a really forward lean would be a planche. There's a Mexican handstand where you've got a huge arch in your back and there are many, many, many different points of balance. So again, a mistake I made was just thinking that I had to get into this one tiny narrow field of balance and just stay there and then I will be upside down. But yeah. there are many, yeah. many different positions in which you can balance. And so understanding that and understanding that you're just trying to stay with that center of mass over your over your base of support is a really, it opens up the door so much. And I, that really helped me to start to understand, oh, I can relax a little bit more and I can I can move into different positions and still maintain a handstand as opposed to yeah. just trying to find this one arbitrary point that is a handstand. Yeah. And I'll, I'll riff on that a little bit more because quite a lot of, quite a lot of things to talk about there. Um, mm. I guess it's also like, you, you want to be rigid enough that you're not creating too many problems to yourself. And I guess the way of illustrating that is say you had like a noodle and you held the noodle up, you had one end in, in your hands, the other one on here, and then you let it go and you tried to balance it. It's just going to flop to the ground. <laughs> so you can't be too loose, right? Yeah. And then it's kind of, if you get a stick or like a, you know, a broomstick, you can balance it from your hand quite easily. It's, it's simple, but if that broomstick had like three hinges in it, they're all going to be going all over the place. So mm. it's kind of like this rigidity with like room for movement. So there's yeah. a certain level of tension you need and there's a certain level of movement you need as well well to hold a handstand. And then it kind of comes back again to just like looking what the person is doing and giving him that specific cue, I guess, at the right time rather than just being like, hey, guys, like this is just something everyone should do. So, yeah, it, 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 it needs to kind of be on a case-by-case -case basis. Going back a little bit to what you said about how to cultivate body awareness, it's a similar principle, I guess, is just exposing someone to drills where they have like a blind spot so i talk sometimes about the fog like when you go upside down it's like this fog appears around your body and you have no idea where where things Correct. are and i deal yeah. with that with a, with a few different positions i'm working on at the moment i just don't really know what i'm doing filming helps a lot like you know like doing a set filming i advise filming i think you can overfilm and you can do too much of that and get a little bit too caught in your head about it um, there's definitely a lot of value to having days where you just feel everything mm -hmm. you're just going by feel. So this, for me, it's this combination of like the analytical brain side, rewatching the film and trying something different and seeing what that feeling equals in reality when you watch it on playback, but also just going, I've had a lot of breakthroughs in my own practice just by not filming and going by feel. That's that great. is an awesome, cool. awesome tip. And that's actually, that's not something I've heard someone ex explain so succinctly before, but I, could not agree more. I'm a big believer in using a camera to get initial feedback and to help people close the gap between what they feel, what they think their body is doing and what they're actually doing. But not everything is just, after you have a little bit more of that understanding, you've also got to be able to do it in real time. And Definitely. that comes from a lot of focus on feeling. Um, I think probably, especially after you move to other head positions and stuff like that, where you don't have a similar spot, mm -hmm. then the feeling becomes even more important. And that's, I don't think something that you can get from just watching footage back. So yeah. 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 Fully, fully relate to that. And also just in terms of body awareness, like it's good to give an example of a drill or something so people understand, but um, mm. a lot of people, when they, when they kick up to handstand, they, it's like, they don't have legs anymore. They, the legs are an afterthought and, you know, it's half of your body weight, either going over or under or, you know, trying to join them and it's all, all crazy. So like a classic drill that can be useful depending on the person, most people can benefit with their beginners, but, uh, you know, you kick up back to the wall. Let's find the edge of my frame. Well, well, how weird. So everything's reversed. So that's the wall. You kick up back to the wall, you know, I won't give specifics and technique, but you know, you come, you come off the wall, push with the wrist, you're floating and then swapping the legs back to the wall, float, 
swap the legs slowly back to the wall. Just things that are getting people thinking about and moving their legs around in space. Just again, it can, can be really useful. That kind of ties into what I believe are the three main actions and areas of the body you need to manage to hold a handstand. And it's not taking into account like planche and stuff like that. It's quite general, but you know, it's overwhelming. People are like, oh, Sunday, you know, like I kick up and there's a million things to think about. I go, okay, I go, okay. if that's the case, just focus on these, two things, these three things. The pressure in the hands, pretty non-negotiable. You could go pretty crazy rebalancing with the shoulders and still maybe be able to do it, but it's, it's kind of like an essential thing, you know, pressure in the hands and work on stuff that works that. Then a huge one, obviously, and this, this is one of the most important things in handstands, is shoulder position. So pushing up and creating a bridge of stability between the arm and the rest of the body. That also means that when you push with the hand, that energy travels through and influences the rest of your body in space. Mm. So shoulder position, that's also um, not just pushing up. It's also, you know, if you open a lot with your shoulder, you're underbalanced. If you close too much, you know, you'll probably hurt your wrist, potentially depending on what level you're at, or you're just like overbalance. You can underbalance from that as well. Again, context, <laughs> it depends what else the body is doing. Yeah. And then the third thing, so we've got hands, shoulder position, then we've got feet. And I say, where are the feet in space? What I mean by that is if the legs were together from the hip, changing the position of the feet in space. Again, if you arch a lot, unless you go into a Mexican, which you know we're not going to be doing that with beginners, you're going to fall over. Or if you fold a lot, unless you're able to press back up, you're probably going to fall at that point. So correcting from the hip is a really a really um, useful thing to think about as well. So you get overwhelmed. What's happening in my hands? What's happening in my shoulders? Where are my feet in space? It's just a good thing to just come back to. That's awesome. I'm definitely going to pinch that uh, little explanation. There. That's that's Please really do. good. And there can be so many. I think that's that's phenomenal. There can be so many. And there are so many things to think about. Yeah, but, I made a YouTube video just about those three points. Oh, I was awesome. like, yeah, I was like, if you stop using your hands, your feet. <laughs> you yeah. don't know where the feet are you're and um yeah just broke down some of those things for people just to get them thinking a little bit about those things because it can be it can be really helpful and the most hilarious thing about some of these basics we've been talking to and this previous points is that when i'm having a shitty one arm handstand day it's usually because i'm fucking up one of these basics <laughs> yeah, my shoulder right. position, maybe my shoulders just closed because i'm tired and i'm just not being present enough or, you know, so I'm working full position one arm, so legs together, and I start piking. That's a bad habit of mine. I need to remember to keep that hip extension. Just all these things that I teach people, they come back to haunt me. <laughs> and by doing those correctly, I'm, it's not going to fix everything, depending on the day. There's a lot of things that can go wrong with one arm practice and handstands in general. But more often than not, it's one of those basic fundamentals that I've just become sort of ignorant of on that day or week. Yeah, dude. So first of all, I'll leave a link to that video in the in the, the show notes as well because yeah. I'd love people to check that out. And sure. also another another Sunu uh, quote I'll pull is nothing is sexier or more useful than the basics. So and I think that's it's there's a lot of power in in reducing the complexity and focusing on those big buckets and because so often that, that is where things go wrong. So yeah, I was I'm terrible for that. Like I'm getting better as, as I get more years in the game with this stuff, but it's like another coach i can't remember his name but he talks about like shiny thing syndrome where yeah. you just see this cool tricky trick and then you abandon your basics and put that in your program and then your <laughs> basics get bad so the shiny trick is even harder to do like it, it it really comes back to just doing the basics but it's like okay i've got my basics but i also don't want to learn the tricky trick you just have to make sure that you keep a decent amount of your basics maintained and you know it's like how you know stuff that starts becoming easy kind of becomes more the beginning of the session to warm up and then layer some of those harder tricks, I guess, on top without completely abandoning, you know, your foundations. Um, and that's that's a bit that's a bit of an art because people's programs and lives and you know time for training varies. But I guess it's just assessing. You know, if you're, if you're coaching yourself, it's just assessing where you're at and knowing what you can let go of and what you can keep to maintain a certain level while adding new drills and skills to the mix. One hundred percent. That actually leads me onto another question that I want to ask you because the reality is that you know we want to be able to give people information, and not everyone's going to go in high risk specific hand balancing coach. You know, sure. so yeah. there's going to be many people who are going to at least begin by going it alone, and that can be a thorny territory for handstands. So mm -hmm. I'd love to ask you, what do many kind of self guided beginners not understand about how to train? for the handstand and what do they do wrong that sets them back or leads to them spinning their wheels for a long time? What kind of fundamental mistakes do they make? 
Um, one really common one is what people will do is they'll spend a bit of time on the wall at the start. And, you know, they might get somewhat proficient at doing like toe and heel pulls. I call heel pulls wrist drives because it's just more clear. You're driving with the wrists, the feet come off. Um, you know, toe pulls I call chest to wall balancing because, again, it just feels more clear. I don't want when people are training those skills, they think, oh, toe and heel pulls, I need to pull my legs off and they right. kick and stuff like that. So it's just yeah. a different way of phrasing it. Plus, you don't know how people teach certain skills that are commonly described. So maybe I teach it differently. So I just call it something else. Sure. So anyway, they might have decent chest to wall balancing, wrist drives happening. But then before they build up enough proficiency with those elements, and before they have a solid enough freestanding handstand, what a lot of people do is they just completely stop the wall stuff and just go freestanding. And because they're kicking up sometimes and only holding three seconds every 10 attempts, they get really weak again. Yeah, right. Because you're not going to maintain any kind of conditioning from holding three seconds out of 10 attempts, right? So, again, it's this process of seeing where someone's at and going, okay, how much wall do they still need? And you'd only really give up. Again, individually, can't just give this like set thing, but mm. you'd only really stop doing wall completely when you had a pretty damn solid one minute plus freestanding handstand that was consistent. And then that, you know, you're going to be doing you know, maybe a few decently long holds as part of your warm up potentially. But if you just abandon the wall too quickly before your freestanding is so solid that you can just get good volume on your hands, you're going to be in trouble most likely. So, um, Again, like, you know, when someone can't even balance their handstand, a lot of their time is just going to be spent on the wall doing drills. And when they start getting more ability, they'll have some of those wall drills to warm up. They'll still do maybe a decent length chest to wall handstand hold just to fire everything up, warm up their line, just wake everything up. And then they'll do a certain amount of freestanding as well. And you just kind of have to go on a case-by-case -case basis when they can start reducing that and increasing the freestanding stuff. You know, what are their goals? How much time in the week do they have to train um stuff like that yeah 100 percent. so and i think that's that's super super key as well so coming off the wall too early or not Way guess, respecting the wall that's is... what everyone does they just come off the wall basically too quickly and you, you there's there's so much to still learn there and you can still do the freestanding stuff as well it's yeah. just not not leaving that behind too soon when you're still very much at the beginning of the the handstand journey i guess and the freestanding stuff gets way more fun when you're actually catching handstands so yeah and those wall drills help so much with that yeah. process of process as well i mean you do get those 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 lucky few i guess even maybe they haven't done handstands as a kid or been exposed to much movement that just kick up can hold longer and longer and longer and progress quickly i've taught people like that before as well but i would say that's definitely the minority yes 100 percent i wish that I was more like that as well. Is there, are there any other coming off the wall too early? Are there any other really common beginner mistakes, even in mindset in understanding about how much you need to be training, anything like that? that yeah. You can avoid? There's, there's a huge one in terms of mindset. People think that it's like just general strength training and they can just train like once or twice a week and get a lot better. I'm not saying you can't make progress training handstands like twice a week, but it is, that evil combination again of physical preparedness and skill so the skill element for example kicking up and catching takes a lot of volume even when you have prerequisites and you can do your wall drills well your rebalance you know underbalance overbalance is pretty good you still need a lot of volume of just doing that and people often say oh you know kids pick up so quick yes it's you know scientifically proven that kids brains just you know, more plasticity or whatever i don't know the proper term and they pick stuff up quickly but if you watch a kid they get into handstands before school, after school, lunchtime, and they're kicking up and trying to do it. They get excited. They have that frequency and they do a lot of the things they love. So it's not just because they're young. It's because they have often have a different approach as well. So, yeah, a, a common pitfall to answer your question is, is beginners, especially adults, just um, underestimating the amount of work it takes. One question I often ask when I start a short course cycle or start working with a student, I go, have you ever worked at least three times a week for 30 minutes at a time on your handstands for at least three months consistently? How many so, people say yes to that? <laughs> very rare. Yeah. Very, very rare. Yeah. So that's just an answer in, it, in itself. It's like just adherence. It's like, as you've, we've talked about, it is a hard thing. It's not to put people off. You know, anyone can pretty much, you know, learn. But, um, 
it takes work. It can't be bought. There's no instant gratification. A lot of people are looking, oh, can I just have three tips? And then they think they're going to hold a handstand. It's like, no, they might be the right three tips. They might help you a lot, but you'll still need to apply those tips over weeks and months to notice any kind of real change. So people give up too soon and don't practice enough, generally speaking. 100%. And I also think that especially for, you know, my understanding of the body is far more to do with the strength stuff than the hand balancing stuff. But Another huge thing that I see as well is people not applying, while it's definitely not, a, it's not just re- like regular strength training, a lot of the principles of regular strength training still apply. So, yeah, for human, example, like if you... Human body still is a human body. Yes, so, absolutely. Yeah. So, if you warm up with a 30-second chest to wall hold and you only ever do that then you're not going to really be getting that much stronger because you're not really significantly increasing the volume of the work that you're doing or the intensity of the work that you're doing. So you might get more and more proficient at just that, but your overall work capacity is not really going to go up very much. Absolutely. So if that's one of the limiting factors to how you're practicing the handstand, if if it's already three minutes, well, maybe to get your first handstand, you don't really need to focus on taking that to five minutes straight away. No, it's not going to make no difference. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. But if, you're early on and 30 seconds is challenging. Even if a minute's challenging for one set and the second set you're getting, you know, 45 seconds or something like that, we need to make sure that we're still applying some degree of progressive overload to, oh, yeah. to the strength and capacity work. It Definitely. doesn't change just because it's a handstand or because kids can do it. Like there is still a strength element and a very oh, specific yeah. strength element too as well. When you're in a kind of end range shoulder flexion, that's going to make it so much easier for you to learn how to hold the positions and learn how to do everything. So applying those same strength training fundamentals to your strength and endurance work of the handstand, I think is another really key. Absolutely. And it's just the art of balancing that with what is generally required of like more frequency. Yes. So it's just getting the right balance because you can easily do a strength and conditioning bodyweight session or with weights or whatever and push too hard and not be able to handstand properly for two days afterwards. <laughs> yeah, I've, yeah. I've tried, I've tried that myself. Um, so it's, it's you, you take those, like, I guess those principles from, like, say, like, Polican principles, you know, Charles Polican, awesome dude. He's got a great book, Polican principles. So it's all about just the programming and fundamentals of, like, strength, strength development and mass development. Um, and you've got to take those things and then you have to translate them into handstand language or handstand yes. world, I guess, and take yes. into account the unique variables of that practice but those things still apply they often just need to be modified because we're not bodybuilding or doing powerlifting we're now doing handstands but we still need strength and conditioning so it's kind of for me it was a, a big process of road testing on myself and working with other people and experimentation to kind of get to where i am now and it's always changing like each course i do i, I modify stuff i definitely um i'm pretty critical of what i do so i try and keep it like evolving and i think that's another point when it comes to mindset with handstands and coaching there's a fine line between being like critical and being overcritical which is counterproductive and there's a fine line between being happy with your doing and being too happy and just no longer trying to progress what you're doing whether it's your practice or your coaching so that's been it's at times a difficult one for me to walk but um I definitely feel these days in a much better place with, with all of that. I think it is part of it is just maturity. You get older and you just realize your bullshit and your patterns and you just kind of grow up a little bit, I guess. It's a very simple way of putting it. Yeah. And some people don't as well, but I think that oh, hopefully yeah. that yeah. growing up, that growing up thing, I think is a, d- a direct result of that, of that at least some kind of self-awareness and some critical eye, not necessarily criticism, but critical eye for what you're doing and, and how to progress it. And, and I personally definitely struggle with the same thing and i don't know if i'll ever get it perfectly right that perfect middle way the entire time but i certainly get better at forgiving myself when i stray out of side and um but i think that's only that's a practice thing as well right so yeah it's the cliche of you just got to make mistakes and you learn from them Mm -hmm. but i guess the key is learning from them and applying it because you know we can all probably relate everyone listening me and you to making the same mistakes quite a lot of times over and over again before finally getting the message. And you go, damn it, if only I just sort of listened to myself or that person two years ago then. Yeah. But that's just hindsight, not much you can do. But, you know, hopefully yeah. next time you have a mistake or a, a flaw going on, you can respond to it a little bit sooner. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, so the next kind of 
topic that I have. I've written the, I've written the title, The Barren Desolate Wasteland of Handstand Plateaus. And, <laughs> and this is a place that people get stuck for months or sometimes even oh, years. I, I, I've, I've lived in the desert. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's one of the most frustrating things that can possibly happen to to anyone um yeah. and i want to talk to you a little bit about this this whole idea of plateauing and handstands because some people are of the opinion that it's absolutely inevitable and it's just going to happen and other people oh, yeah. think that you can you know have the right method or but i want to start by asking you like what do you think is going on in principle during a plateau let's just say that someone's kind of being at the stage where they're like kicking up and every 10, 20 reps, they're getting like a uh, kick up, they're getting like a three to four second hold. And they've just kind of been there for like a year. What do you think is happening? And how would you diagnose I that? Made, kind of I made a post about this. So yeah, okay. I minimize you for a second. You can just edit out this long. <laughs> no, no, it's all staying in, dude. <laughs> I'm just going to zoom my, in. Where's, it. where's my document? <laughs> zoom in slow motion on your face as this happens. <laughs> Great. <laughs> So you have a plateau. Something I think about it is like what part of the skill is the roadblock? You know, mm. is it flexibility? Is it strength? Or is it the skill element itself? So it's kind of like a filter you mm. could run it through. Like a Another diagnosis. Thing, yes, a diagnosis. My, my brother um, yeah, talks about like he calls it selling like a doctor, but it really means when you meet someone for the first time and they've asked you to help them, you just... You know, you have to analyze what's going on and, and have a tack. Uh, you could talk to them. I mean, communication is probably the biggest thing with coaching. Communication mm. is just everything. Um, so another point is, have I solid solidified previous progressions or skipped any? So that's mm -hmm. a huge one. You know, have, you know, have I skipped over anything that's fundamental? And Can you give me an example of like a progression like a, that one could skip over and that could bite them, bite them in the ass? Bite them in the ass? Um, Let's have a good think about this. I guess back to like rebalance drills, like is your like overbalance and underbalance corrections off the wall just crap? Right. And then you're kicking up and only holding for three seconds. Like that's really common. There's often a very strong correlation between someone having like, in my mind, like mastered those drills and there's different layers of progression for those drills as well uh, that I usually teach. So when someone's quite proficient at those, I generally see a pretty big increase in their ability to hold their handstand. It's almost like you work those balance mechanics, you work the kick up, and they eventually kind of meet in, meet in the middle. So that, that, that'd be like a quick and dirty example. Nice. And also another one is people sometimes create the idea that they're in a plateau when they aren't. They just don't realise that what they're doing is quite impressive or difficult and it's just going to take more time. So yeah, another point huge. that I made here on one of these posts was, am I being realistic with how much time it's going to take or am I simply being impatient? Some things take years to develop. They just do. Yeah. It might not even be a plateau. And another thing is like... Sometimes it's kind of like the frog boiling in the pot. You know, the frog's in the pot, it's boiling. It doesn't realise that it's boiling, eventually being cooked and eaten. It can be like that with yourself where someone might have not seen you for a month and they come and go, wow, that's really improved. And you go, what, really? I feel like I've been stuck because you're there with, your, with yourself every day just watching, you know, looking at your videos and just thinking you're not getting better. But it's, it's even when someone's progressing quickly with handstands and a lot of things, it's just a little bit, little bit, little bit, little bit, little bit. So you do have to like, like sort of call it like zooming out and zooming in. You have to kind of zoom out a little bit sometimes and just look at the bigger picture to, to realize what's going on in that, in that sense. And also another point is like, am I making any progress with my current approach or do I need to seek outside guidance? Mm -hmm. Like sometimes you've just exhausted, you know, your little toolkit and it's just, you know, you really are plateauing. Maybe it's been months without any even small improvement. Um, to lead on to another post and point I've made before, and this is a, this can be a, a plateau buster. And again, this is something that a coach can often help you identify. And I call it productive and unproductive failure. Nice. So, and this, this is like a little bit like esoteric, I guess. I'll try and explain it my best, which is like, you can be practicing a skill and failing in a way that's never going to lead to success in that skill. And you can be practicing a skill and failing in a way that's productive, that's eventually building to something. That's huge, dude. So, so I, I, I guess, and it ties back to some previous points. It's like, okay, I'll give you an example and it's a bit out there, but I recently, it's been about a month now, started working on a specific kick up to one arm drill. It's kind of like a cartwheel kick up to holding a one arm. 
and I'd never worked it before. Uh, amazing hand balancer called Yuval at Yuval Oz on Instagram. Does some really cool stuff. And he inspired me with this particular drill. Great guy. Check him out. Yeah. Um, and I have the prerequisite. The main prerequisite of that skill is obviously a solid one arm handstand, at least on my right side, pretty confident on the right. Um, so I knew that it was a good time to begin working it. Um, and I was training it, but each, each session, each week I was failing. Like, you know, it took me, like I calculated out like almost a thousand attempts before I got it. I do 30 attempts every practice session for about a month working, you know, five days a week, whatever, 30 minimum probably. But I just felt like I was getting closer, 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 closer. I was understanding it, but I was falling and fucking up all over the place. I got videos of me just going, meh, meh, falling over all crazy. And then eventually after four weeks, I started getting my first ones. Now I've been getting almost one every session. So like loads of work to go to get it solid, but it was productive failure. I had the previous main progression for it. I had somewhat of a technical idea of what I needed to do. And I felt each week that I was feeling like it was moving towards something or towards somewhere. And I guess unproductive failure could be going back to a lot of previous points we made in this call about, you know, someone's shit scared of falling you see them go to the middle of the room and they kick up, you know, halfway up, barely making yeah. it up, and they come back down. And, you know, a month goes by, they're still doing that. A year goes by, they're still doing that. That would be an example of unproductive failure. You're failing and nothing's never, ever going to happen unless you address that key point of learning how to fall and not being scared. Dude, that's such a powerful concept. And that can be applied to not just handstands, but so many different skills. And I think a big key with the unproductive failure side of things, there's there's the feedback loop is far too open. The feedback, the the time between kicking up halfway and doing that same mistake, the very same category of mistake, the very same specific mistake over and over and over again is not being identified and worked on and progressed so that you can make a slightly better quality of mistake or anything like that. There's just like the same thing over and over again. There's no yeah. feedback loop of, of understanding how to improve that specific thing. Even if you're yeah. still failing, even if you're still making mistakes to progress up and to make less of the same kind of mistake or to make less mistakes overall altogether until, or to make mistakes in a different aspect of the skill with that one being slightly more proficient. That's kind of how you start to approach those complex skills and, yeah, I think that's a really, really awesome, just fundamental principle that someone can look at themselves if they've just been stuck in a plateau. It can be really frustrating. And regardless of how much of a plateau it actually is, it can still feel really frustrating. But I feel like, yeah, yeah this whole doctor approach of the diagnosis and then trying to figure out, okay, yeah, kind of triaging a little bit, like, well, where is the problem? Where's the breakdown? Where is the 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 limiting factor in my yeah. ability to progress? Absolutely. And, and sometimes it's like, well, how much do you practice? And again, they, you know, they say, oh, yeah. I practice once every fortnight. We're like, well, that's probably the main thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's like, if you're practicing a skill and it's just like zero change, specifically if it's not a strength related skill, yeah. it's just like a skill skill, like kicking up and catching or like balancing a one-arm handstand provided you have the physical conditioning and you keep doing the same thing. And for like, you know, extended period of time, like a month or two, like zero perceptible improvement. That could be just because you're doing what we just talked about. You're just doing exactly the same thing and expecting a different result. Um, so in that case, like just trying something different, mm -hmm. like just just whatever variable you can think of changing, just just, just try and even change it. Um, and yeah, it's just it's just one of those things. Just don't keep doing the same thing that's not working because it's not it's not going to just generally suddenly one day happen if you're just failing unproductively i guess we can use that word again 100 percent. and i think that one more slight uh slight deviation from this but definitely still in in the same theme and i might have mentioned this example on another podcast so forgive me if i have but i use the example of surfing and with complex skills you can often spend a lot of time practicing but almost zero time in the specific position or situation that you're trying to cultivate skill. Sure. Yeah. So for example, in surfing, like when I first started surfing and I used to hate surfing when I first started it because it's I, difficult, <laughs> especially I lived in Melbourne. And so I drive an hour and a half out of the city to get down to a break. I get changed into my wetsuit after we look at the, look at the break. I'd paddle yeah. out, I get smashed. I'd get in 
And then I'd sit there. I didn't know where to sit. I'd wait for the wave to come and I'd try and paddle onto the wave. Finally, when one would come and I'd be in the right position and no one else was there and I'd fuck up my pop-up. Yeah. I have likened it. Yeah, go, go. yeah I'd, I'd do that for an hour and a half and then get out of the water and then get changed and drive back home. I spent like six hours dedicated to surfing and I've spent zero time with my feet on a board. Yeah. So how much better have I got at surfing in that time? Not at all. Even though I spent yeah. six hours, and I could do that twice a week. Oh my God, I spent so much time surfing. I'm just not getting better. Well, the, the analogy to handstands is the kick up without ever carrying catching any time in the handstand. If you're only kicking up in the middle of the floor, one in 20, one in 40, you might have spent six seconds in an uncontrolled handstand the entire session doing that twice a week. Well, 12 seconds is not really enough in a, in a whole over the course of seven days to create some kind of real meaningful stimulus. Definitely. So I, what do you... I, I, yeah, absolutely, yeah. I absolutely relate to that. I mean, for yeah. me, I likened learning how to surf myself. I learned when I was like early teens was like pretty much putting myself in a giant washing machine with a hard piece of wood and putting it on like spin cycle. Like <laughs> yeah. that's basically learning to surf initially. Like, yeah. it's, 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 it's full on. And, and like what you're saying is really true. Like mm-hmm. instead of just paddling out on some big break and trying to go like across the face of the wave, you're much better off just like learning basic tools just like literally on the sand with the board yeah. and then going to a nice soft beach break and just catching white water and yeah. even just on your tummy to start with just riding across the wet like straight not across sorry yeah. on your stomach and then eventually trying to just pop up and just stand on the board as it moves forward like on a bigger more stable board not some little yeah. short oh, performance ex- piece like. exactly like one of those big foam kind of like yeah. sort of things yeah you will just learn so much quicker that way so yeah yeah, I can relate to that having surfed a bit when I was. Yeah, there. yeah, and I'd say the equivalent to that, the equivalent to the handstand, the equivalent to your bigger board in the smaller, less less hectic waves is the wall, a more stable surface to help you spend more time in that position, and then progressively spend less and less time. Like you're still using the wall as a proxy and as assistance, but mm-hmm. maybe you start with just a static chest to wall hold as a, just a pure example. There's many different. Yeah. But just as this example, you might start with a static chest to wall hold where there's no real motion at all. And you're just trying to get used to being in that position. And then you might start with one leg on the wall and just swapping the legs really quickly in that total kind of drill. And then maybe there'll be slightly more time in between swapping of the legs, which will yeah. be even more time with the wall there, but you're still spending far more time upside down. And that's slowly, slowly filling in the gaps between where you are up. and where you want to be, but you're not just spending all this time and energy thinking that you're training the handstand when really you've actually spent very little time doing anything that's direct practice for the skill. Definitely. hundred percent agree with that. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 It's cool how there's um, parallels yes. between, between everything, between surfing, between handstands. I even had a pretty important parallel the other day. I did archery for the first time, right? Nice. And you know, one of my flaws occasionally bites me in the butt and I've gotten better with it, but it's just like overthinking everything. Life, handstands, in the moment, training Guilty. a particular skill. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. And when I was doing archery, I realised, and we were doing like instinctive archery, I guess. We didn't have sights or aiming, ta- aiming or anything. We are just hitting a target. And when I just sort of like, you know, drew the bow back and just focused on the target and just how things felt, I was much more accurate than when I tried to like, point to a specific spot with the arrow and really think about it too much. And it was like a super simple thing. And I was kind of like, ah, oh, interesting. And I went back and practiced the next day on a few schools that had been bothering me a little bit. And I just realized that I was thinking too much in the moment. But as we said earlier today, I just needed to feel in that moment and just instinctively to react what was taking place on that particular attempt. But again, an earlier thing we said is you fall and fuck up for different reasons sometimes every attempt. Yeah. And I realized I had just kind of forgotten that. I was just getting too caught up in what I needed to do then rather than what I needed to do in that moment to hold the position. Dude, that's an awesome, awesome transfer, awesome takeaway. And this is this is starting to lead me in the direction where I want to ask you a couple more questions to close up. Because like you mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, this whole practice has been personal development as well. Yeah, um, and yeah, like that's you know, it's a bit funny, but at the same time, it's it's true. And oh, yeah. I'd love to, yeah, I'd love to really ask you, like, what lessons have you learned in this whole eight years of hand, the really dedicated handstand practice that you've been able to apply to other parts of your life? Yeah, it's definitely taught me patience. So just 
just patience in general, patience with everything in life, I guess, and just realizing that it takes time for any meaningful change to take and to take place in a lot of different things, especially if it's something, you know, difficult and worthwhile doing, it's just going to take time. So I guess, again, I have that more of a zoomed out approach to a, to a lot of things now as well, and a little bit more of a strategic mindset than I did when I was younger. Um, Another thing I taught me, it's it kind of quite a humbling experience. Like I said, when I started, I thought I was special and this, that, and the other, and there was a fair bit of ego involved. We all have an ego and I won't go right into all that kind of stuff, but it's definitely made me just a bit more accepting of, of where I'm at and not always trying to, I guess, yeah, I guess when I started, I, I kind of wanted to do it in some way to feel good about myself. Because there, there was issues, I guess, around um, self-esteem. Mm. You know, and, and, and you grow up and everyone's doing cool stuff and you're reading this and that. And I, I, I just felt like I would feel better about myself as I got more and more skilled. And it's a huge trap because it's like when someone's like, oh, when I earn this much money here, I'll feel good. But I'm, and then they're a billionaire and they're still unhappy, right? So it was, it, it was a total trap. But ultimately I realized like why I did it was not to feel good about myself. Really. It was just like a love for the specific, I guess, let's call it like an art form, but even more than that, it's not just about the handstands. I think for me, I've always had to do some kind of physical training. It's kind of like therapy for me just to move my body and just being really present. And I guess handstands teaches you focus as well. And that's another attribute I've learned from it. It's just being really present. It's, um, it is definitely a form of meditation. And especially as you get to some of the higher levels and you start developing a one-arm practice, you really do have to focus a lot. Even a momentary lapse in, in concentration can make you just fall out of some of the more difficult positions, depending on, on where you're at. Um, and you see it when you teach people as well. They're like holding and then they fall and they're like, oh, yeah, I just thought about something else for a second. If a second's long enough for you to lose, lose balance and, and, and fall out of it. So... Yeah, those are definitely some 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 key lessons I've learned. Um, it's also just given me confidence because it because it is a challenging, grueling thing to do, and I could have given up many times along the way, and I just kind of stuck with it. So now, when I approach something new that's difficult, I guess I'm just not as hard at my on myself and not picking it up and being great at it straight out of the bat. I have a bit more compassion with myself, I guess, with with new things. And I'm also definitely way more conscious of like, do I actually want to take this thing on? Yeah. <laughs> yeah I have a realistic understanding. It's like, do I want to start this really involved hobby or new training thing? So sometimes it's just a no because I, I have a more of an understanding of what's involved. Yeah. I think that's that's so important. That's really cool. And that self-esteem one is is such a it's such an interesting one because yeah, I think I, I definitely, not specifically with hand balancing, but I think with just fitness in general, I definitely had that out of the gate, wanting to go and get more proficient in this because I thought that once I could do more things or look a certain way that I would feel better about myself. Totally. And it's tricky because in one sense I was right, but it didn't work how I thought it was going to work. Like in the beginning, I thought, well, maybe once I can do a handstand and a backflip, I will look at my ability to do those things and think better about myself because of that. And that's not how it works. No. I'm not like fucking, oh, thank God I can do a backflip now. My life is so much better. Like, not yeah. at all. But this the whole cliche, it's the process. But like, yeah. but the process of actually doing those things and overcoming those, practicing really, really hard, being really that patient, makes you feel better about yourself. One hundred process of doing it, not the skill and thing itself. Yeah, yeah. you really yeah. nailed it on the head. Then that's you. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm thinking of summing it up it. like I'm it's not the destination; it like it's the journey or something. Yeah, no, no, I, I think, think you, I just you, made you, that up. Then, yeah, that was great. <laughs> yeah, this is recorded. Yeah, that's, <laughs> no, that's but, an awesome way of putting it. It's like that, and like I said earlier, like that's that confidence you get from just going through all of that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, as, as much of it's, as it's a fucking cliche, like I think it's, it's important to highlight because I don't want to ever give someone the opinion that like it's not worth starting because you're not going to feel any happier when you do it because that's not, not necessarily true, I think. While there are many, it's not the achievement of the thing because there are many, like you said, billionaires who have made all the money, more money than they ever dreamed of and still fucking hate life. 
same thing with you know fitness you know fitness mm. professionals and fitness enthusiasts and whatever there's plenty of people to look it happens with like, everything in life for me when i absolutely. started training it was like oh if my muscles are bigger i'll feel yes. better about myself you know when you're like, sure. you know, 18 years old training the gym just going Rrr. yeah yeah you know or if i'm you know if i was taller or if i was richer or wh- whatever it is you think that you're, you're then going to be happy but it's just it's not really the case no, absolutely not. But then on the other side as well, like the process, I'll, I'll speak myself, like the process of going and doing things that I actually didn't think I was going to be able to do, or I didn't have the faith in myself to even give myself a chance to do. And then after I accomplished like a couple of more smaller menial things, and I'm like, maybe I could actually do the next thing. And then once mm-hmm. I achieve that, maybe I could actually do this. like that process of achievement, that process of failing forwards developing a better relationship with failure, all of those different things that can come from a dedicated practice like hand dancing. Yeah, developing a better relationship with yourself, I guess. 100%. And that in turn eventually makes you, made me anyway, helped me feel better about myself. Yeah, I 100% relate to that. Yeah. So it's it's not quite so simple as, as one or the other, but I think, yeah, it can definitely teach you, teach you a lot. Yeah. It's been it's been a great teacher for me personally. Yeah, dude. I wanted to quickly come back to that focus as a, as a last question. You mentioned the focus that it brings you as well. Do you find that that focus has transferred to other areas of your life? That's a good one. Um, and I have never been officially diagnosed, but I feel like I'm a little bit ADHD. Sure. You know, all my report cards from when I was growing up were like, Sunday has trouble focusing, Sydney has potential, you know, blah, 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 blah. And then another classic characteristic is I can focus with laser-like focus on things I'm really interested in mm. but if I'm not interested in them I just look at the look at the page and just look at a bunch of swiggles and I just don't take anything in so I definitely have a little bit of that and it's something that I've been like working through because obviously you know running a coaching business there's you know the fun stuff that I can focus on is the coaching and you know program writing and my practice but there's the other side of things there's you know writing up Posts, which they can be fun to do, but sometimes you just have to force yourself to write. Yeah. There's, you know, managing your calendar, all kinds of different things that, that go on there. And yeah, sometimes it's hard to focus on that stuff. I think for me, as I get older, I, I've settled a bit and I have a bit more focus just naturally. I do think the practice of doing Hanson's has helped cultivate a bit more focus. The biggest one for me personally, though, is meditation. Even just 10 minutes at the start of my day. If I meditate at the start of my day and don't jump straight off on my phone, I have a lot more just focus and presence throughout the day. Um, even just simple things like we're, we're in a very distracting society, you know, with, with our phones always on us and messages and things popping up. If I limit my phone time, I also have a lot more focus. And I think there's, there's quite a few cool guys on YouTube, again, don't remember specific names, but um, that talk about, when people say, oh, I'm not a very focused person or, oh, I'm not a very patient person, that these are actually skills and qualities, just like handstands, that you can practice. So you yes. can practice focus. You can practice patience. So I've started thinking about it a little bit like that rather than, oh, maybe I potentially have ADHD or some other disorder and I can't focus as maybe I just haven't practiced focusing enough and I and trying to think of it that way. And it does seem, it does seem to help. And I seem to be able to be more efficient with my workflows and processes, even with the stuff that's not as exciting. Man, I'm so glad I asked you that question. That was such a good answer. And, you know, that's definitely my stance on it as well. And this is not, I'm not a doctor. And this is not to say that disorders don't exist or anything oh, like that. Of course. Yeah. But that's it, what you just described is an incredibly empowering for yourself statement and it's an empowering mindset because to whatever extent or not or not that someone does have a disorder like ADHD Mm. they will always be able to move themselves further along by by deliberate practice of things like focus and patience and and practices like meditation and it might be harder for that person but I don't think that it's really impossible for anyone except the rarest of rarer cases. Mm-hmm. And I think that anyone, even if you don't have fucking ADHD, man, like we are assaulted by distractions oh. and things that are, you know, being thieves of our attention and playing with our, our hormone it's and the reward circuitry. Commodity. Our, our attention is the greatest commodity. 100%. That's, that's, that's what everyone's vying for. It's just our yeah. attention. And 
Yeah. So I think that just some form of practice of both digital hygiene, as I like to call it, like just understanding, yeah. yeah, like understanding how to manage your input so that you have some focus and attention left to dedicate to things you actually care about. And also a formal practice like meditation and or hand dancing is a really good pincer approach. And no matter where you are along that spectrum of attention to make that a little bit more, yeah, to become a little bit more proficient in that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a good attitude to have, I believe. Yeah, dude, man, this has been super fun. I've really enjoyed. Yeah. yeah I've really great. enjoyed chatting to you and you've dropped some absolute bombs, both philosophically <laughs> and, and handstand specific. So well, that's yeah, I, I envisioned long, awkward pauses and, <laughs> <laughs> and a, a thinking block. But yeah, it's, it was good. It was um, This is going to be a pleasure yeah. to edit, man. There's going to be none of those. So yeah, yeah I really. Yeah, it, was, it was good. I think we got into some pretty good nitty gritty stuff that will hopefully be useful to some listeners out there. 100%, man.